to our conversation on th safe and thriving communities. Um, we are expecting a lot more people than are here right now. So um, if you have to grab, like, glad you all made it tonight, grab your drink, take a breather. I know you've been in back-to-back -back meetings all day like I have. So take a few minutes and then we're going to get started um, in a little bit. So welcome and we will see you soon. I gotta run, John. <laughs> okay, I said I gotta run. Yeah, yeah. So are you cool? Like you got paid or whatever? Or are you old? Okay, good. All right, so I'll check you later. Thanks. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I see that the room is filling up. Welcome. Welcome to our conversation on safe and thriving communities, the second of three of these conversations, with the final one being on Tuesday night. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, as people are filling the room, please uh, feel free to breathe and relax for a few minutes before we get started. We have quite a few folks signed up tonight and we're only about less than a third there. So just hold on and we will get started shortly and welcome. Good evening and welcome. We are reaching critical mass soon and um, we'll be starting our program momentarily. So thank you for joining us this evening and we will get started very shortly.
All right, good evening and welcome to our conversations, creating safe and thriving communities. My name is Denise Barreto and I am the Director of Equity and Inclusion um, for Cook County Government Offices under the President. Um, I welcome for welcome you to this conversation and that is a cross collaboration between uh, three of our uh, jurisdictions in this area, the city of Chicago, Cook County government and the state of Illinois. Um, I would like to ask if you are not one of our panelists, if you um, could turn off your camera until you're speaking because it'll help with our bandwidth on tonight's call and please feel free to um, join us and join this conversation throughout the chat. And we will have an opportunity at the end after we get through the whole uh, program uh, for question and answer. And we are looking forward to that. And you'll be able to open your mic and ask any question um, that you would like. Um, at this time, I would like to welcome um, our chief of staff, Lynetta Haynes Turner for some welcoming remarks. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us in this conversation as we work to build safe and thriving communities in Illinois. I'm grateful to all of the county and state officials who have joined us. Uh, Chris Patterson, Assistant Secretary of the Office of Firearm Violence Prevention from the state of Illinois. Delrice Adams, Executive Director of the Illinois Criminal Justice Information Authority for the state of Illinois. Jay Stapleton from the City of Chicago Mayor's Office, Amar Risky, Chief Financial Officer for Cook County, Soshi Flores, Bureau Chief of Economic Development for Cook County, and Avik Doss, Executive Director of the Justice Advisory Council for Cook County. Special thanks must also go to Denise Barreto, who just introduced herself and will be moderating the discussion over the evening. We are here to talk about the historic level of federal American Rescue Plan funding coming to our region for economic development and violence prevention initiatives. Over the past year, there has been an unprecedented level of planning, coordination, and collaboration to prepare for this funding. This evening's conversation is intended to promote transparency and ensure the community is informed about the plans for this funding. We also invite you to participate in the question and answer portion of the event after the presentation via the chat function and encourage you to engage in the conversation about how we are working to build safe and thriving communities for all of our residents. I will also note that we will be using a PowerPoint presentation this evening. It will be distributed to everyone. We have your email addresses and we will be putting additional information in the chat box. And for reference, this event tonight is being recorded. Cook County first committed to the concept of building safe and thriving communities in 2018 with the five year strategic plan that prioritized equity investments in criminal justice reform. And since then, we have continued to focus on these priorities. In 2020, we created the Cook County Equity Fund and Equity Fund Task Force to ensure we continue to support historically disinvested communities in meaningful ways. The state of Illinois and the city of Chicago have also invested specifically in equity uh, and building their internal infrastructure around equity. With the onset of the pandemic, we saw levels of community violence spike. Unfortunately, we're continuing to see tragically high levels of gun violence, particularly in our black and brown communities who have been left vulnerable due to decades of historic disinvestment. We knew that a comprehensive, robust and thoughtful response would be needed to address this urge. In 2021, the American Rescue Plan Act was signed into law by President Joe Biden and the federal government allocated $1 billion of funding to Cook County for COVID-19 relief. And collectively with the um, allocations for the state of Illinois and the city of Chicago, Illinois is receiving $10 billion of federal relief. The county undertook a comprehensive and collaborative planning process as did our partners at the state and the city level. These two words, safe and thriving, represent an important connection. These concepts are interrelated and complementary. We bring about safe communities through investing in programs and services that support residents most at risk of being involved in community violence as a victim or a perpetrator. 
We bring about thriving communities through thoughtful economic investment at the community level, supporting families, organizations, and small businesses. When we allow the conditions that lead to crime and violence to persist, we will continue to suffer from these issues. But when we address these conditions, when residents' needs are met, and when families have real financial stability, we build resilient communities that are safe and thriving in the long term. Later, you will hear from the leadership of the state, the city, and the county, who will all talk about the initiatives that we are all doing collectively and individually to create safe and thriving communities. So without further ado, I'd like to put up the slide deck and we will um, make sure that we are efficient in our presentation so that we have appropriate time to ask and answer questions. All right, so I want to start by talking a little bit about the intergovernmental coordination. It is unprecedented and very intentional that we have um, colleagues from the state of Illinois and the city of Chicago and Cook County who have been working for nearly a year to intentionally focus on the ARPA relief funding that we all receive that we are designating to violence prevention efforts along with economic development. Over the course of the last year, there have been work group meetings and a very intentional focus on coordinating to try to maximize the impact of the grant dollars that will go to those communities that need it the most to create and hopefully sustain community safety across all of our communities in the city of Chicago and in suburban Cook. So with that being said, the next few speakers uh, will a um, 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 uh, chief financial officer Mar Risky will just touch very lightly on the county's planning process around ARPA, and then we have our bureau chief of economic development, Soshi Flores, who will talk about the economic development aspect of ensuring that we have the supports in place to really reduce violence and improve the safety of all of our communities and make sure that they're thriving. Uh, and then furthermore, after that, you will hear a number of presentations specifically around the violence prevention funding and how each of the agencies are working collectively and individually to bring programs and services to the communities that need it the most. Okay. Uh, and we would ask that we maybe mute um, if you're not currently speaking as we go through the presentation. And I will turn it over. Next slide to Amar. Thank you, Lynetta. Um, I think we lost our slides. Can you get the back again, Cara? All right. Well, we bring those slides back up. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Amar Risky. I'm the county's chief financial officer. Um, as Lynetta mentioned, the county uh, under the American Rescue Plan that was signed by President Biden back uh, in April, March of last year, I want to say, uh, is on uh, scheduled to receive about a little over a billion dollars. Uh, and that funding, uh, you know, was directly sent to the county. Uh, but when you combine that with what the city of Chicago, plus a lot of local municipalities and state got, there is truly an unprecedented level of funding that is being received um, uh, within our region. And, and a lot of that can go to help support some of the work that we are going to be talking about today uh, when it comes to keeping a safe and thriving communities. Um, so, specifically when it comes to the county's allocation, uh, over the past few years, the county's uh, been slowly working at improving its own fiscal health. And so, as a result, uh, when we entered the pandemic, you know, we did uh, sustain a lot of revenue losses uh, ourselves, but we were still able to maintain uh, the level of services that we needed to provide for our residents uh, throughout that, that level. Now, as we start to slowly make our way back out, um, this funding that that is the the true intention of this funding is to help uh, uh, the recovery of our region from this pandemic. What we have done is we've created two buckets of this this uh, this billion dollars. Uh, one is a smaller bucket, is about three hundred million, uh, which we will be uh, earmarking for county operations that we can continue to sustain our our operations as our revenues are slowly still recovering from uh, from the pandemic, uh, but. The bigger chunk uh, is about $700 million, almost 70 plus percent of, of this funding will be going towards uh, our community programs. Um, over the past couple of months, the county board uh, of commissioners has approved 
uh, roughly about $420 million of that 700 um, and, and uh, of that billion for, for uh, community-based programming. Uh, and that $320 million that is supposed to go towards that programming over the last year and this year is roughly divided into these policy pillars uh, that you see before you at the bottom of the slide. Uh, just a bit on that, in 2018, um, county uh, put together a county road uh, policy roadmap um, that really articulated the areas that we wanted to make sure that we we're making impacts in that are going to improve our residents' lives. Those pillars are vital communities that speaks to our economic development efforts, save and thriving, that, that uh, talks about violence prevention, some of the things we're going to get into detail today. Um, healthy communities uh, where we run a big public safety net hospital along with our public health department. We want to make sure that we have good uh, supporting systems there. Uh, smart communities to ensure that we're providing access to uh, broadband and other um, uh, newer technologies to our residents, where especially the most vulnerable ones, and then sustainable, uh, not last but not least, to ensure that we are looking at climate uh, change and, and, and some of the uh, challenges that it's proposing on our region uh, to address some of those needs. So if you go to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about some of the programming that has been uh, uh, approved by the county board in some of these specific areas. So as you can see from the from the top left corner around healthy communities, the county has al board has allocated $60 million. Uh, a number of these things are going to go towards uh, healthcare initiatives where, you know, uh, Department of Public Health, along with our health system, is going to take the lead around ensuring that we are uh, recovering from this uh, pandemic very quickly. Uh, vaccination efforts, outreach to hard to reach communities, those types of things. Um, moving to vital communities, and you'll hear more about it from my colleague, Soshi Flores, uh, 100 million, because as the pandemic set in real quickly, it also became an economic uh, calamity for a number of us, both for, at a business and, uh, level as well as an individual level. And so the county is looking to stand up a number of programs to support small businesses and then social services programs towards households and some of the other sectors that have been really hard hit, like tourism and hoteling, for example. Safe and thriving, I'm not going to go into details in this one because uh, my colleagues will go a lot, talk a lot about that. But again, those are important things we want to address. Uh, it's then sustainable and smart communities to ensure, you know, we're, we're addressing some of the needs out there, especially when it comes to water. Uh, as well as uh, pollution mitigation and ensuring that digital equity when I talked about around um, the uh, the broadband uh, access for our low, low income residents. And so uh, these areas over the next few months, uh, weeks and months, you'll hear more about them as the county starts to launch these things uh, more broadly. But as you can see, there's a lot of intersection between all of them uh, when it comes to how do we address some of the root causes of violence that we see today and, and that's where the thoughtful aspects of how we've talked about, um, you know, and, and how we want to spend these and allocate these funds has been such an important uh, piece of work. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Soshi Flores, who's our Bureau Chief of Economic Development, to talk about some more details on that front. Thank you. Thank you, Omar. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Soshi Flores, and I am the chief of the county's Bureau of Economic Development. I am very excited to be with you today, and thank you for taking the time to join us and learn more about the programs that we have to offer for our communities and residents. Um, just to begin, uh, the mission of our bureau is really to lead and promote equitable economic growth and community development throughout Cook County. So we work very closely with 134 municipalities throughout the county, um, and we offer a wide range of programs and services for both residents and businesses with the overall goal of driving sustained economic growth and providing promoting vibrant community development throughout our county. What is very important to underscore in this work is that the development of all of our work, um, absolutely over the last two years, but historically within this administration, as we develop all of our work, looking at the metrics, looking at how we design our programs, how we monitor of our, the impact of each of our programs, Cook County prioritize, it prioritizes advancing equity systems change and ensuring that we are catalyzing transformative impact. As we con constantly discuss across all of our departments and agencies, it's very easy to distribute funding 
the most important part of investing this funding is ensuring that we work across the table with all of these agencies, with the various levels of government to maximize the impact of these funds. That cannot be done in a silo. That requires the county, the city, the state to come together and figure out how we're going to leverage this funding, hopefully alongside philanthropic partners in the private sector to really make an impact in our communities. Next slide, please. So for 2022, our Bureau will be investing nearly one third of the county's ARPA dollars to support investments in vital communities, as Amar mentioned. Um, that includes support for small businesses, for critical household assistance and social services, like our emergency rental assistance program and our legal aid and housing debt program, um, providing targeted relief to hard hit sectors, and also continuing on with developing extensive housing programs to make sure that our residents remain safely housed. And finally, we have a slew of programs around workforce development but we want to continue to build on the programs that we developed in response to COVID. So in 2022, we will play an increasingly active role in the region's small business ecosystem. And we want to ensure that with these efforts, we continue to focus on promoting equity throughout the county. In particular, um, our 2022 small business agenda includes development of a Cook County one-stop shop. It's called the Cook County Small Business Source. And our near-term program will facilitate business growth and sustainability for many of the early stage businesses that we saw opened up over, over COVID. It was amazing to see the increase in these small mom and pop shops. Mm -hmm. And we want to ensure that we're there supporting them and ensure that they continue to remain viable um, businesses within our communities. And the way we're going to do that is not just by providing grants, which we know are extremely necessary, but also we're coupling that with advising services through our network of small business, um, business service organizations. Additionally, we're going to improve access to capital for women, Black and Latinx owned small businesses through developing new financial resources and leveraging private investment. So I look forward to continuing to evolve those programs, rolling out those programs, because we know that providing economic stability is critical to the success of our region. Um, we cannot just look at municipal boundaries or county boundaries. It is important that we work across municipal boundaries and even across the counties so that we can strengthen our region because we know that together we will collectively begin to address the economic disparities that have plagued our communities. We will begin to address the poverty that we have seen plague our communities. And hopefully we will ensure that we have positive impact on both the residents and businesses of our of our county. So I look forward to continuing to work with our city partners, our state partners, and ensuring that we really leverage one another's expertise and resources to make um, a tremendous impact on this region. So now I will turn it back over to Denise. Thank you. Thank you, Sochi. And I'd love to welcome to the mic, Chris Patterson from IDHS. Chris. Good evening, everyone, and thank you. So I'm Chris Patterson, Assistant Secretary of the Office of Firearm Violence Prevention for the Illinois Department of Human Services. So several uh, grant opportunities or notice of funding opportunities have gone out from the Office of Firearm Violence Prevention, first starting at training and technical assistance, where we'll be giving support um, to organizations that are funded through the Reimagine Public Safety Act. Reimagine Public Safety Act uh, brought to us by the Governor J.B. Pritzker and the Illinois General Assembly uh, guaranteed a $250 million investment towards violence prevention over the next three years. Uh, in order for us to be strong in that effort, we have to support 
and give the organizations that are uh, receiving, providing the technical assistance and support that you may have heard about earlier today and just now. An additional funding opportunity from this pool of fun funding will be community conveners, which in each one of the 2022 20, plus communities in Chicago, there will be um, a, com a community convener. This grant is now um, was open and is now closed to the public. The violence prevention services, which we have, uh, we're excited to say while all of these funding opportunities have gone through the first round and have closed, we've identified the providers for each. And in the first week of May, we will be opening up the violence prevention services and the youth development programming, which you see here. Lastly, our high risk youth intervention program is intended to work with young people who have been involved in the justice system um, to make sure that they are no longer trapped in that cycle of violence and or in the justice system. Next slide, please. First round grantee rollout. As I told you, the first round has gone out. Um, inside of that funding opportunity is $42 million in new reimagined public safety funding has gone out. Uh, and that begins May 2022. Summer surge funding. So to make sure that there was additional funding uh, on the ground for the summer months, we had increased the contracts for several youth development organizations across the state and in Chicago. That would be an additional $10 million. The re no fault for violence prevention and youth development as we spoke about, uh, will be early May. Uh, look out for those notice of funding opportunities in the link that you'll see it, you'll have it at the, at the end of this presentation. Across the state of Illinois, uh, there are 16 municipalities in which are gonna be funded and supported through this effort. Each municipality will have a local advisory council. That local advisory council will give recommendations to this office, the Office of Firearm Violence Prevention, how we should fund that municipality. We do not want to go into a municipality and, and advise them how they should do violence prevention. In fact, we want to be listening and we want to go on the advice of the people who live in that community. Next slide, please. Summer surge strategy. So as you can see, here's a breakdown of the funding opportunities uh, from the Office of Firearm Violence Prevention. And you'll hear a lot more about what our city and our county partners are also doing as well as our sister agency, ICJA. For the training and technical assistance, already there has been $3.6 million gone out, contracts uh, for providers for those communities so that those providers have the additional supports they're gonna need. $2.2 million in convener funds, high risk youth intervention, slightly under $5 million, we're cited to see $17 million in youth development across the state and violence prevention with an unprecedented close to $25 million investment uh, with a total of $52 million um, towards this, this reduction uh, from the Reimagined Public Safety Act. And I will remind you that this is just round one. Round two is coming out the first week of May. Next slide, please. So RPSA, or the Reimagined Public Safety Act, requires that the Office of Firearm Violence Prevention convene local advisory councils, and I spoke about this. The local advisory councils will be a minimum of five individuals from each municipality that we fund outside of Chicago. So that would be, um, and, there's a, and there's a list of those locations on the DHS, IDHS website that will identify where each one of those municipalities are. With a minimum of five members, we are seeking input from that community on how to fund, as I spoke about earlier. We are excited to say that our first meeting happened March 15th. Uh, we are having an additional meeting coming up in May, uh, and, and those recommendations are going to be coming into um, my office or the Office of Fire and Violence Prevention for recommendations. And so we're excited to be partnering with the local advisory councils across the state 
and our partners here in the city of Chicago and our partners, Cook County. And I think that's the end of my slides. And with that, I think I'll pass it back to Denise. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, at this time, we want to turn it over to Director Adams at ACJA. Del Reese. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much um, to Cook County and the leadership of President Preckwinkle for having the state here as guests. And, and this is truly a monumental time for our state. And so I want to just dive right in and talk about I see just efforts um, and just give you a little bit of background. Many people don't know what I see just does. They know us for our grant making um, through federal grants for victim services and violence prevention, but we are also a research and analysis unit and we do robust crime trends, criminal justice um, reporting on our website is a lot of very good information for organizations who are beginning their practices and want to learn and do evidence-based and promising practices. Um, and so you can find a lot of resources on the ICJA website. We are also a policy and planning organization where we work with all of the stakeholders across the state in the criminal justice arena and, and really look at how we can prevent crime and how we can increase the use and broaden the definition of victim assistance in our state to really serve those vulnerable and marginalized communities. And lastly, we are information systems and technology for the state of Illinois. Um, as I mentioned, we're a state administrating agency, and so the money that comes down from the federal um, entities as well as um, through the um, General Assembly um, often lands in ICJA's um, lap. And so we use a lot of data um, to support that work. And we also like to partner across city, county, and um, our other stakeholders to help them with data to really make sure that our efforts are data driven. Next slide, please. Um, so ICJA was mandated as the um, state agency for criminal justice and violence prevention to do a statewide violence prevention plan. That plan was released in September. It was developed by an ad hoc committee of over 130 partners across um, the table. You, we had county members, city members, as well as community-based organizations and eight of our state partners. So there is a comprehensive plan that can be utilized. It's very interactive on our website, and it could be a guide for organizations across the state. Um, as you heard from Lynetta and our other partners here and um, Assistant Secretary Patterson, and you'll hear from the city and, and JAC, we have all been doing that coordinated collaborative work to make sure that we not only leverage each other resources, but that we have a comprehensive strategy across the state for violence prevention. There's not a silver bullet for this work and it's gonna take time, but believe you me, we are all working diligently diligently to make sure that communities are resourced and that we're using a public health and public safety approach to violence prevention, that we're looking at root causes and really understanding those social indicators that communities need to be able to address the specific violence trends in their community. We want to center this work around equity and community-led strategies. And Secretary, Assistant Secretary Patterson touched on that. Um, talking about his local advisory councils, we all in the, in the county also has um, a mechanism where they're bringing in voices. We have roundtables. Um, the city has had their talks across the city. And so we're all leaning in and listening. We're all trying to understand what exactly are the solutions that community want to raise up, because we truly believe that the solutions lie in the communities that are really being harmed and impacted the most by violence. Next slide, please. And so for ICJA, um, we have had a violence prevention portfolio for some time now. Uh, we consider ourselves the big V of violence um, because whereas um, IDHS centers on youth development and um, now firearm and gun violence, um, we are across the span of violence. So we look at domestic violence into partner um, violence. We also do re-entry work um, and look at all of the different intersections of violence. And so our portfolio for our fiscal year 22 and 23, because ARPA dollars and some other federal dollars have allowed us to go cross fiscal years, um, is about $248 million. Next slide, please. And so as Chris 
mentioned and raised up and, and most of us will be talking about today, everyone wants to know, what are we doing to get ready for the summer? How are we addressing what we all are experiencing with COVID is an uptick in violence, right? We had made some headway, I would say in 2019, prior to COVID hitting, to really do some reduction in what we knew were high. I mean, just unprecedented numbers in 2016 and 2017. We were seeing downward trends. COVID ripped off the Band-Aid on all of our, what we thought was impactful work. And we, we were doing some incredible work there and just exasperated a lot of the social issues that we knew existed. Um, and so we are all getting ready for summer because we know traditionally there's an uptick and we expect this summer to not only be any different, but to maybe be worse. Um, and so ICJA has become ready to invest $141 million, upwards of that, into communities. We currently have um, close to 65.5 million that are already being provided in terms of awards and contracts to agencies. So those service provisions are already in place. Um, people are, are getting the, the needed services. And then we have a bucket of funding, $12.3 million, that's ARPA dollars, that will be um, up and standing around Memorial Day. Prior to Memorial Day, those contracts started April 15th for early summer investments so that people can really get their programming up and going and have those um, strategies in place and engagement in place for those summer months. And then we go heavy and deep in the summer and beyond. And so we will have close to um, $70 million in funding in the summer. Um, and then we have some fall funding that we just received through the General Assembly um, that are opera dollars related as well. Next slide, please. And so what I'm very excited about and, and just kind of want to end my presentation on is, is what the work that we're doing around equity and grant making. Um, so she mentioned this, the county has been doing incredible work around equity as well as um, partner agencies at the state and the city. Um, and we understand that this is a monumental amount of money and we want to be good stewards of that money. We want agencies to not feel the burden of you know the impact of having so much money like who even knew that could be a problem correct <laughs> but if sometimes you are given you know you have a smaller budget your grassroots organization you've just been doing incredible work by you know the the skin of your teeth and now all of a sudden there's opportunity that never existed and your budget triples or quadruples that can be a burden right you have to scale up fast and so we've um We've launched the Institute to Innovate, and it will begin in June. Well, we're going to be providing that really intense engagement of technical assistance and support with our smaller localized organizations, because we want to make sure that we not only help build capacity along the way, but that we help build sustainability. We want the great work and efforts that people are doing to go along the long haul, because this is not a short game. This is truly a long game for us to transform and have um, long standing impacts in our communities. And when we talk about safe and thriving communities, we also are talking about resiliency. And that resiliency lies in the very organizations and the people that do the work. The other thing that we're doing around equity that we're super excited about is we've um, put our equity score in the NOFO, in the Notice of Funding Opportunity to give a weighted um, score to people who have leadership, um, board members that are reflective of the community they serve or have uh, credible messengers, practitioners, case managers that are actually from the community and also reflective of the, the marginalized populations that they serve. And then the other piece is that we are um, breaking down our review process by a tier of operational budget so that smaller organizations compete against one another and larger organizations compete against one another. And then that equity score is weighted. And when we say weighted, that means that it has a weight of 30 points. If an organization um, has 70 traditional points and 30 equity points, that's 100. Another organization has 100 traditional points, the 30 equi equity points will have more weight in that organization would be put in the list as more favorable than someone that does not, that has a zero equity score. So that's what the weight means. We are also doing two 
policies that we're very excited about. Um, when we talk about burden to organizations, um, we all know the state is a reimbursement model. Um, it has been for the history of the state, and that's probably not going to change without legislation. And so um, a lot of partners in the city and specifically the county, they have been successful in doing an advance pay. Um, IDHS had um, some um, pilots out there for advance pay. And so we, we've we started that as well. And advance pay allows organizations who uh, may not be in a position to start their programs be prior to reimbursement to actually do that, to have some startup and upfront costs. So th there are very two different policies that we're happy to share in more detail um, as people um, need that information. And so I will just land there with my presentation and turn it back over to Denise, but happy to take questions at the Ian. Thank you. Thank you, Director Adams. And now we will welcome um, the Executive Director of the Justice Advisory Council, Avik Das. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Denise. Thank you to uh, my counterparts on the panel. Your work every time I hear it is so inspiring. And I uh, appreciate all those in the audience for attending. You know, we're giving you a quite a bit of information. I'm just acknowledging that in the chat, there are numerous links in the chat for you to access this information subsequently. And of course, this recording is available. Um, I'm Avik Das, the Executive Director of the Justice Advisory Council. Mm -hmm. And I hope you'll see that the themes in the slides that I'm about to present reflect the unprecedented collaboration with the state and the city and how we try to be partners really presenting a unified face and focus and showing up in our communities to help them be safe and thriving with all the great work that we know is being done. How can we make very, very smart investments together? On the screen, you have the four areas of work that the Justice Advisory Council, working under the auspices of Cook County Board President Tony Preckwinkle, this is what we do to reduce reliance on incarceration and court system and increase community safety in our support with, through community-led efforts and policy work. So we have policy work, community engagement, service coordination as key areas of Justice Advisory Council work, but I'm focusing on grant making specifically in violence prevention. If we could get to the next slide. So historically, the Justice Advisory Council at the Cook County level has had, you'll see in the left column, different categories of grant making investments over, the over time. In the middle column, you can see that we may have started at around $5 million in 2015. We've grown to $14 million in 2022 with a historical investment of over $50 million over the years. Our largest grant portfolio item is violence prevention, approximately $7 million with over 100 service providers in our entire portfolio. Drawing your attention to the rightmost part of the column, I did want to point out that we don't view our investments in a vacuum. What we are looking at is the whole person, the resident, and how we show up as a shareholder in their success in helping them be safe and thriving in partnership with the state, in partnership with the city, and we center violence prevention as part of that strategy across our categories. And so with that, next slide. We are pleased to have an open grant opportunity focused on gun violence prevention and reduction that reflects the unprecedented dollar amounts from the American Rescue Plan Act that we are attempting to coordinate right alongside the state and the city. And it's focused on gun violence up to $65 million. We have created tracks in there for different budgets for, applica for applicants so that we could try to cast as wide a net to invite first time applicants, veteran applicants to be able to participate in this grant opportunity at the county level. A deadline has already passed for applications that are asking for 1.5 million or more over three years of the grant award. That was in April 11th, but on May 9th, we are expecting what we hope a robust set of applicants for budgets under $1.5 million, again, focused on gun violence prevention and reduction and building on our years of grant making, but now so much more in collaboration with the state and the city. Next slide. 
these items represent the categories of services that we recognize have some close nexus, have been participating in that realm of violence prevention. And you'll see that the terms have been calibrated to reflect the kinds of terms being used at the state level and the city level. And these are the areas that we're trying to also be shareholders in and invest in in this grant um, um, opportunity that we have out. Next slide, please. So, um, Assistant Secretary uh, Patterson had mentioned geographic areas that the state is looking at where the concentrations of shootings, gun related homicides have occurred. And indeed, we've calibrated our target areas against where the state is investing, where the city is investing. And these are the geographic clusters that are reflected in our gun violence prevention and reduction grant opportunity. And I land there and with that, hand it back to Denise. Yes, thank you, Avik. And so we are about to introduce our last speaker of the evening. It's Jay Stapleton from the city of Chicago. I'll take this moment to remind you that um, you are feel free to put your questions in the chat. But after Jay's presentation, we will open it up um, for a question and answer of all of our panelists. Jay. Thank you, Denise. Good evening, everyone. Um, as Denise said, my name is Jay Stapleton. I'm the Senior Director for Social Services Policy in the Office of Mayor Lori Lightfoot. Um, and just want to thank everyone for being here today to learn about the upcoming grant opportunities that we have. And also um, thank Lynetta and all of our partners at the county and the state um, for putting this together because I think as Several folks have already said, and I will echo, um, we really are working together, I think, in a new and transformational way to ensure that these uh, funding opportunities are aligned. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the city of Chicago is dedicating over $400 million to address the root causes of violence in our most vulnerable communities. And I think um, this mirrors what was uh, shared earlier in terms of really wanting to ensure that we're taking a holistic approach to violence prevention. I'll talk a little bit more specifically about what you see in the first column in terms of the uh, grants that are specific to violence intervention, but wanted to start by couching it in the approach that, you know, like our partners at the state and county, we really are thinking about the root causes of violence and with investments from the American Rescue Plan, as well as um, a bond investment, all of that has been put together in what we call the Chicago Recovery Plan. And it includes some of the investments you see on the screen here that span across housing, um, cash assistance, health and wellness, community development and small business supports. Next slide, please. Uh, so to share a little bit more specifically about the direct violence intervention grants um, that the city has been and will be issuing, we have $30 million that are focused specifically on youth intervention and justice diversion, $20 million that is looking to expand services for youth who are, who are um, justice involved, who are at risk of um, being victims of or participating in violence. And that really spans the gamut of providing case management, um, linkage to youth, summer employment, um, other wraparound supports that a young person or their family might need. Um, so the first round of funding for this um, went out earlier in the year and then we'll be, we will be issuing additional rounds um, in the upcoming months. We are still working on the set deadline. Um, the links in the chat that folks have been sharing will um, be continually updated as funding opportunities become available. Um, we also have $10 million that are dedicated specifically to the implementation of a new deflection and diversion model in Chicago. So looking at how we can bring together social service providers with our partners in um, the justice system to understand how we can deflect and divert youth so that when a young person um, is coming into contact with the justice system, we're really taking a trauma-informed approach and thinking about how we can divert them out of that system um, as much as possible. Next slide, please. We also have $55 million in violence reduction interventions that are not youth specific. Uh, almost 19 million of that is going to uh, staffing and um, supporting our community safety coordination center. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that on the next slides. 
But really, I think, as I said, you know, the theme that you've heard from all the folks here is just the importance of uh, coordinating across multiple actors at different levels of government, at different levels uh, or within uh, different departments and bureaus within government. And so um, we really want to be intentional about building that infrastructure to facilitate coordination and not just within government, but also with community. Um, so as, as other folks have mentioned, you know, we really want to ensure that we are centering community voice and having a community-led approach. I think that's a, a tenant that all of the stakeholders here on this call are, are really um, championing and centering in our work. Um, we'll also have $10 million dedicated to special initiatives um, for and community supports, including expanding block clubs, um, and procuring and distributing safety resources for residents. And then finally, a little over 26 million for um, programs such as street outreach and victim services. Next slide, please. So I wanna talk a little bit more about what the Community Safety Coordination Center is. So when we say community-based and hyper-local, uh, we're really talking about what it means like at the block level. So how can we bring together folks from um, all over the city, county, state to focus on that block level, be data informed um, in identifying those blocks that are really experiencing the highest rates of violence and work with community members on those blocks to design and implement violence reduction strategies. Um, so we, Mayor Lightfoot stood up the Community Safety Coordination Center um, at the end of last year and we are um, have the infrastructure in place now where we are working actively with community leaders in each of the communities uh, most heavily impacted by violence, bringing data to them and asking them, you know, what does this data mean to you? How can we work together to be thinking about how this data informs the programming that we're rolling out and then coordinating the resources that are identified as being needed by community? Next slide, please. For the summer, we wanted to lift up three primary initiatives uh, that the CSCC will be working on. One is home and business protection, so providing private security equipment um, uh, to residents, to business owners through rebates and grants to help them have um, to build the infrastructure to increase safety um, and aid in, in, in crime fighting. Uh, secondly, as I mentioned earlier, we will be um, providing supports for block clubs and looking at how we can continue to, to strengthen and support the social fabric of, of these blocks in these neighborhoods and coordinating with the block clubs to uh, proactively address streetscape issues. You know, we, we know that the, the built environment has a direct impact on violence. So thinking about how we can work um, with community to impact that. And then finally, uh, standing up community area networks. So bringing together service providers at a very hyper-local level to um, talk about the data, as I said, and really think about what it means to bring those folks um, together at the hyper-local level and have real-time information and be um, facilitating a nimble response as um, we see the trends that are emerging throughout the summer. Um, I will stop there and turn it back over to Denise. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Jay. And thank you to everybody for holding tight and hanging in there with us. As you see in front of you, that's the, the, uh, the links um, to all of the agencies that have been represented here tonight that we've repeated a couple times. And you can see they've been posted in the chat as well. And um, Rest assured, they are in this presentation that also will be sent to you. So we have quite a few um, questions in the chat. We can start with Jennifer Cunningham's question um, regarding the NOFO in early May for youth development and violence. Um, Jennifer wants to know, can we confirm that all the opportunities will be advanced pay, i.e. not fee for service? Also, will the advanced pay model continue into future and NOFOs? Fee for service makes it difficult to scale up new programs. So if it's all advanced pay, that is tremendous. Thank you, Jennifer, for that um, that question. And I would say that's directed probably to our state partners, correct? The NOFOs, that was, yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, because she asked specifically about the youth, I'll I'll let um, Assistant Secretary Patterson answer that. But for ICJA, um, all of our agencies who request advance pay will have an application. And if for some reason they don't qualify for advance pay, that's when the working capital policy comes into play. So that is available to all of our violence prevention funding um, agencies at this point. And I, I'll turn it over to um, Chris. Well, thank you. And yes, I think I will affirm as well the governor, uh, Governor J.B. Pritzker is intentional about making sure that smaller organizations are at the table and have an opportunity to to do this work without having to come out of their own pocket. And so um, for those organizations that qualify, uh, we will continue to make that accessible. Excellent. Thank you. I just want to remind folks you can also oh, you can also raise your hand and, and then you guys don't have to hear me read all the questions. Um, our next question came from Keela Smith Upton about the chat being available, which um, we went ahead and put those links in there for you and um, we will probably not have the chat available. Pam Bosley asks, and I see the hands that are up. Michael Allen, you will be next after I read Pam's question. When will the community grant be rolled out for the block clubs? I think that might be a city question. Yeah, yep. Jay? Yep, we are targeting um, a, a release of the block club uh, support in June. And again, just to reiterate what's already been said, all of the opportunities will be posted immediately to the links that Denise has shared in the chat. Thank you. Um, oh, Michael, you can, your hand's up and it's in the chat, so I'm not going to read it. Why don't you open your mic and ask? All right. Thank you. Uh, who qualifies for the rebates for home security systems and, and, and then how do we access uh, that rebate? Yeah, so as of right now, the rebate program has not launched yet, so we're we're still doing the the final work to to make those determinations. Um, what is currently live is um, folks who have security cameras already and want to register with sh the Chicago Police Department. Um, they are able to do that. It does not um, grant the police access to your camera. They have to ask every single time. You can say no. Um, but that the first step was getting that that system built up and then the rebate program will be launching again, hopefully in June and specific guidance on who is eligible will be included um, in detail when that launches. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. I see Princess Shaw. I see your hand. You can open your mic and ask your question, please. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and thank everybody for all of the lovely information. I'll be sure to carry it back to the communities. So I think this is kind of like a um, round, kind of like across the table question for the city, state, and um, the county. So regarding the community grant for block clubs, right? Um, you have smaller organizations that are actually out there doing the ground grassroots work already. Um, sometimes they happen to be overlooked. And my question becomes, how do you um, filter them in as well as already having those block clubs that are already established and already up and running? Um, because I'm working with a couple of the actual uh, different groups or what have you. And what we're doing is um, as a city just for Lawndale and a couple of other West Side and we're expanding it out. We're like, hey, we're tired of seeing, you know, people being overlooked. So we're putting a comprehensive plan together that's bringing all of the different organizations together and on different levels. So one person will be doing the training. The other one will make sure that they understand what they're getting themselves into. Another one will be helping with paperwork. So how would a person that's going that part of this model that we're doing, how would Example, I am able, right? They've been doing this since 2012, 2009. How would they, or where would they start to fill out for um, grants, right? Would they be a state level? Would they be at a county level? Or would they be at a city level, right? Because they kind of qualify for all of them across the board. Anyone can jump in here? I, I think we all can speak to this. <laughs> Oh, but I'll, I'll go first um, because there are just two very specific things that ICJA 
offers. One is um, R3, um, which is the cannabis tax revenue that goes back into community. The amazing thing about R3 in the foresight that the, the Black Caucus and other legislators had when they formed it is it specifically for new organizations, innovative programming, things that have never been done before. Traditionally, um, we, you know, most state agencies ask organizations to come with some level of experience, well, R3 is wide open to new and innovative ideas. Um, and that grant opportunity will probably cycle every year. We just closed it in May um, or every other year. Um, so if you go to our website or the R3 website and sign up, you'll see that. The other real quick plug is our Innovations Institute, where we will be looking and doing releasing a, a request for information for organizations just like um, what you're describing, Princess, to actually um, be placed into the Institute and given support and on ramp to small state funding, but supported in a way that you can launch your programs, but also have um, support and technical assistance to understand how to um, successfully administer a state grant. I think I would add to that bit of advice, um, Princess and, and anyone else who's interested, is the a little bit of due diligence when it comes to uh, searching out what particular funding opportunities apply to you and your organization. And because there's such a, a, a diverse array of funding opportunities, um, I feel confident that an organization that is providing services for the community, um, services that are gonna save people's lives and or make the city and state county better, uh, there's gonna be something for that particular organization. And so it takes just a little bit of due diligence. We have the links inside this um, the chat uh, where you can find where all of those are at and we'll continue to um, make sure that we're communicating to the public as we're doing today uh, through the remainder of this funding opportunity. Avik or Jay, you can jump in and just so you know, Ray and um, the other person whose hands up, let me just see Jennifer, we will get to you in just a second. Avik um, and then Jay. Sure, I, I'm trying not to repeat. We echo the techniques, the intent of being inclusive in the number of applications. And I think, Princess, you're very much on point that there is, we're all coming out in very similar time frames, and there is a level of due diligence on the part of the potential applicant as to how best to see where they fit in, because the intention is to be very open for multiple applications, et cetera. At the county level, I just wanted to point out, and I hope uh, those who are looking at our grant opportunities, you'll see we've tried to make it where folks who are asking for smaller, sort of newer type programs aren't necessarily having to go in the same tracks as those who have been veterans, larger programs that have multiple, uh, have offered applications multiple times. And in that same breath, we've tried to make it where the person who's applying might be the lead agency in a matter, but there could be a number of folks who are coming up uh, alongside that person in a given geographic area that then they're putting forth their innovative program, but they're doing so in that kind of strategic way, building on what might already exist, where the talents are, and they're kind of coming together to the various grantors as a, as a group you know, sort of a strategic presentation that then we were, were, were able to stitch together something comprehensive across the different grant streams. Yeah, I think I can just bring us home by saying, you know, across the board, I think all of the government actors here are trying to think about how it to make it easier for organizations to do business with us, right? So whether it's the cash mobilization or the cash advance um, that the state is talking about, the city is also doing a similar program. You know, I saw Del Reese dropped in the chat. We have one website that is looking to just in very plain language in a clean format, summarize what each of these grants is for. Um, I do, you know, to your your point, I, I think it is, it is gonna take a little bit of searching. There's a lot of funding. Um, and so it is possible that an organization may want to leverage fund from all the funds from all the actors on this call or, you know, may only have the bandwidth to do one. And I think that's, you know, at the discretion of each organization to figure out. 
I think what we are trying to do is ensure that we can make it as easy as possible to navigate those opportunities and that we're also collaborating to ensure that our funding is working together and that um, an organization does not have to work at cross purposes and fill out the same thing to do like three different forms to do the same thing in one community area. You know, we're really trying to think about how we can ensure coverage and maximize impact. Um, so I will leave it there. Excellent, Ray, and then Jennifer, and then we'll answer Pam's uh, question in the chat as our last one. Ray? Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is Ray Robinson from the Community Engagement here in Cook County. I'm a liaison. I just want to say thanks to everyone on this call. You all are my real superheroes. Uh, I'm in the community on a regular basis. I have contact with those that have perpetrated violence and those that are victims of violence. You all are uh, all the hard work that you guys do, all the struggle, and just thank God it's a, it's a time, it's been actually, it's, it's over time that we finally have resources that are gonna reach the ground root and make some type of impact. Small victories with this violence that's going on in the community. I wanna say you guys are great. I appreciate working with all you guys. It's been a long time coming. Thank God the time has come. Ray, that was so kind of you. We appreciate you, appreciate Ray. that. Love getting the flowers now, right? Um, Jennifer Cunningham, um, you were next, and then we'll bring it home with Marcus. I see his hand. Uh, oh, we have Pam's question too, which was uh, the process of getting the advance pay. But let's, um, Jennifer Cunningham, you've been waiting a bit. Hi, yes. thank you all so much for this opportunity and for um, for taking a second question for me. I'm representing Access Living of Metropolitan Chicago. Yeah, hello, yes. Um, <laughs> we serve people with disabilities. You know, it's an identity that crosses all economic, um, racial, gender identity, and sexuality lines. And um, what I am wondering is, would we be permitted to serve um, just people with disabilities? Often when we are, for example, applying for youth funding, we actually cannot apply because, um, oh, for example, there was one with the city that would have routed um, kids to us. And, you know, we don't like having to turn people away, but our, our specialty is serving people with disabilities. So, A, you know, we're, we're new um, in the, in the violence prevention and and treatment of the aftermath field but we believe we have a lot to offer to survivors of gun violence who have experienced um health events that have caused them to be disabled physically mentally you know there's a lot of invisible disabilities long story short would we be permitted to limit our services to folks who identify as people with disabilities so jennifer thank you for that and i think i can answer by saying the victim service the, with the outreach dollars, particularly from Reimagine, the victim service dollars, and I know those dollars exist uh, within the city, and I believe in, in some capacity with the county as well. Uh, those, we are encouraging organizations to partner with each other to mm -hmm. subcontract grants. And so if you're on the violence prevention grant, it has case management, victim service, and street outreach. And so if you're partnered, which I would encourage, because it's always a stronger um, element we bring to the community in partnership, uh, I think, you know, and I'm thinking about how we can, you know, kind of work around, right, the parameters in which you're trying to work as an organization. And I think maybe that could be one solution, uh, not the solution for you, but um, some an avenue to keep you uh, in the violence prevention space. Yeah, I would plus one that, I, I think. That's exactly right. And um, Jennifer, I would just say for, uh, you know, our ICJA grant, we have a lot of um, victim services and victim assistance grants. So you would definitely fall within those buckets. Um, for us, like when we look at grants and we review Kim grants, um, if you were only doing that population and your cost, um, you know, your budget for the grant made sense that you were doing a smaller targeted pool of that population, I, I don't see how a reviewer would, you know, give you any kind of negative scoring for just focusing on one population. We get applications similar to that all the time where people will just, you know, focus on a targeted 
um, population group, I just would encourage you to have a very strong justification and make sure that your um, your budget kind of lines up with that. But as we're expanding the definition of victim services, um, I think seeing more applications where gunshot victims and victims of um, violent crimes are included in that definition is definitely a priority of the lieutenant governor and, and what we've been looking at in, in our applications. Excellent. Um, I want to note um, uh, there's two final questions, one from Marcus and one from Rick. So we'll get to you in one second. There are uh, a couple of questions ago that I have to scroll up um, regarding Wynetta Scales asks, um, several agencies are starting new programs and expanding existing services to reach community areas. Is there a sustainability plan after the funding has ended? I know um, Del Reese had touched a little bit on this, but if anybody will answer the what's the sustainability, especially for those particularly new and expanding um, programs, any any panelists can take it. Well, this is um, this is something we're all confronting. Uh, we are trying to make it where our we're doing a moonshot of investments over the course of this ARPA timeline, three to five years, and we want to come together of how we are going to say these are the models that we think are the most effective. These are the, the kind of uh, approaches that we want to see working in these contexts. And then we want to come together to sort of say, OK, what are the patterns where we can expand or scale or sustain the workforce that is doing that kind of work? So I have to say that the the that, that is an excellent question that's on all of it. It's keeping us all up, I think, at, at night about how we do this. We're having unprecedented dollars in the immediate term, and it's going to be unprecedented learning for how we keep this going beyond. Um, and so while the answers are not entirely firm just yet, the commitment to be able to say, this is where we go, it can't just be one and done, with that we have to walk alongside all these folks that take us up on these investments. Let's try to, let's try to build that out for the years to come. That's definitely out there. And if I could just hop in and say this is I, I love that question Winetta. like thank you for even planning that and, and having us have this discussion. But I think this is where that shared accountability happens where you help us make the case where organizations are able to define what success is in their communities and do the impactful work so that you make our job really easy to make the case for why this type of program or these type of services should be sustained. And then understanding like the state budget, right? Right? Like R3 is, is a revenue that's going to keep on growing. I mean, like who knew Illinoisans was going to indulge in, in the cannabis industry, right? And so we are always looking to shift and, and make those, as we say, we lean it into community for you all to give us solutions. Um, and so this is a time of, I say, accountability because the reports we're really looking at those for guidance and understanding of what programs are actually having those impacts. So this to me is a shared space and, and I thank you for lifting that up and you guys can help us shape what does sustainability look like when these federal dollars sunset. I, I agree. I would just add one last thing to that, which is I think this is also why everyone um, on this call is talking about root causes. So, you know, as we're thinking about how we're reacting to and trying to prevent violence, we're also thinking about what are investments that we can make in those root causes, working with the private sector, small businesses, things like that, to really think about how we're um, investing in these communities now so that, you know, we're at a different place three years from now when we're trying to evaluate, um, to, the, to Del Reese's point, evaluate you know, what works and what we're learning. Excellent. Marcus, you have the floor and then we'll close out with Rick. Good evening, everyone, and thanks to all the presenters this evening. My name is Marcus Gill with the Woodlawn Restorative Justice Hub and also represent Dust and Clean Maintenance. I have two questions. So the first question is in regards to the Justice Advisory Council grant that's coming May 9th. I saw communities that was actually um, listed 
but uh, the community that we serve, Woodlawn, it was not listed, and but we also work with surrounding areas. I just wanted to make sure, just some, for clarity purposes, we run a holistic program that's sitting around civic engagement, restorative justice practices, mental health, and just wanted to make sure that we are able to actually um, go after that grant for the, those purposes. Uh, are we able to still um, have a chance to go after those grant funds? Thank you, Marcus. Uh, this is, yes, the bottom line is yes. The, the geographic cluster within which mm -hmm. our data show certain concentrations of shooting per capita, those were just guidelines. Okay. So the hope is that you land in a particular geographic cluster and are able to, in your application, demonstrate how you're showing up relative to gun violence, and that will be reviewed. All right, and the second part of the question, I thank you, I appreciate that. And then we are hoping that the work that we are doing that are reducing the violence that's within our community and world line, but as far as with economic sustainability and far as for small businesses, I don't know who can answer this question, or are there any grant funding that's coming for um, for small businesses for new development and um, sustaining economic vitality over in the Woodlawn community as well? Yeah, so I can I can say thank you for the question, Marcus. On the city side, there are community development grants. I do not have the exact geographic parameters in front of me, but I can ensure that I get that to um, Denise and others to send out as a follow up with the slides. Excellent, thank you. Rick? Uh, yes, uh, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you yeah. perfectly. Thank yeah, you. I had uh, I noticed all of the uh, discussion of, of social intervention programs to prevent violence, but, but uh, I noticed no one uh, or you didn't have any members of law enforcement present to discuss uh, tactics that they might uh, improve on to uh, prevent, also help prevent uh, crime. Uh, so I think uh, uh, you all need to, or well, someone needs to focus not just on the social service programs, but also some uh, strategies for uh, getting law enforcement uh, to improve its strategies for combating crime. Thank you for that, Rick. We have noted your um, recommendation. All right. Thank you very much. All righty, everyone. Um, we, um, um, Pam, both of your questions, the question regarding advanced disbursement um, from ICJA and firearm grant, that will be through the links that we put out there. Um, and I think someone else asked a question about scaling up. And again, all of our um, all of our presenters have touched on um, how to do that. And you will be able to find that information on our Greater Together, the Chicago Together, the link that has all three of them. Um, and you can also look in our individual links. All right. Um, yes. And Jay just put something in regarding Marcus's question about the community development grants. All right. Um, Woodlawn is eligible. Yay. Thank you all. This was a marathon, wonderful time. And as you know, we did um, record this. So there is one additional session like this next Tuesday. And I can assure you that uh, the session from Tuesday was a little bit different than tonight. So please, um, you know, make sure we spread the word that if people can't make it to that last session, that they can get a copy of one of the um, one of the recordings. And with that, we're going to close our evening. I want to thank everyone uh, from the state, the city, and all my colleagues at the county. And I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you thank for joining you. us. Good night. Good night.